Welcome to Reading is Succeeding Audiobooks. Listen and follow along with your copy of Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing by Judy Bloom. Chapter 5 The Birthday Bash I got used to the way Fudge looked without his top front teeth. He looked like a very small first grader. Dr. Brown, our dentist, said he'd have to wait until he was six or seven to get his grown-up teeth. I started calling him Fang, because when he smiles, all you can see are the top two side teeth next to the big space. So it looks like he has fangs. My mother didn't like that. I want you to stop calling him Fang, she told me. What should I call him? I asked. Farley Drexel? Just plain fudge will be fine, my mother said. What's wrong with Farley Drexel? I asked. How come you named him that if you don't like it? I like it fine, my mother said. But right now we call him Fudge, not Farley, not Drexel, and not Fang. What's wrong with Fang? I asked. I think it sounds neat. Fang is an insult. Oh, come on, Mom, he doesn't even know what a fang is. But I know, Peter, and I don't like it. Okay, okay, I promise never to call my brother Fang again. But secretly, whenever I look at him, I think it. My brother, Fang Hatcher. Nobody can stop me from thinking. My mind is my own. Fudge is going to be three years old. My mother said he should have a birthday party with some of his friends. He plays with three other little kids who live in our building. There's Jenny, Ralph, and Sam. My mother invited them to Fudge's party. Grandma said she'd come over to help. My father couldn't make it. He had a Saturday business appointment. I wanted to go to Jimmy Fargo's, but my mother said she needed me to supervise the games. The kids were invited from 1 until 2.30. That's only an hour and a half, my mother reminded me. That's not so bad, is it, Peter? I don't know yet, I told her. Ask me later. The kitchen table was set up for the party. The cloth and napkins and paper plates and cups all matched. They had pictures of Superman on them. Right before party time, Grandma tried to change Fudge into his new suit. But he screamed his head off about it. No suit! No suit! No, no, no! My mother tried to reason with him. It's your birthday, Fudgy. All your friends are coming. You want to look like a big boy, don't you? While she was talking to him, she managed to get him into his shirt and pants. But he wouldn't let her put on his shoes. He kicked and carried on until my mother and grandmother were both black and blue. Finally, they decided as long as he was in his suit, his feet didn't matter. So he wore his old bedroom slippers. Ralph arrived first. He's really fat, and he isn't even four years old. He doesn't say much either. He grunts and grabs a lot, though. Usually his mouth is stuffed full of something. So the first thing Ralph did was wander into the kitchen. He looked around for something to eat, but Grandma was guarding the place. She kept telling him, No, no, must wait until the other children come. Jenny arrived next. She was wearing little white gloves and party shoes. She even carried a pocketbook. Besides that, she had on dirty jeans and an old sweater. Her mother apologized for her clothes but said she couldn't do anything with Jenny lately, especially since she had taken to biting. What does she bite, I asked, thinking about the furniture or toys or stuff like that. She bites people, Jenny's mother said, but you don't have to worry about it unless her teeth go through the skin. Otherwise, it's perfectly safe. I thought, poor old fudge. He can't even bite back since he hasn't got any top front teeth. I looked at Jenny. She seemed so innocent. It was hard to believe she was a vampire. Sam came last. He carried a big present for Fudge, but he was crying. It's just a stage he's going through, his mother explained. 
Everything scares him, especially birthday parties. But he'll be fine, won't you, Sam? Sam grabbed onto his mother's leg and screamed, Take me home! Take me home! Somehow, Sam's mother untangled herself from Sam's grip and left. So at five after one, we were ready to begin. We had an eater, a biter, and a crier. I thought that 2.30 would never come. I also thought my mother was slightly crazy for dreaming up the party in the first place. Doesn't Fudge have any normal friends, I whispered. There's nothing wrong with Fudgy's friends, my mother whispered back. All small children are like that. Grandma got them seated around the kitchen table. She put a party hat on each kid's head. Sam screamed, Get it off! Get it off! But the others wore their hats and didn't complain. My mother snapped a picture of them with her new camera. Then Grandma turned off the lights and my mother lit the candles on Fudge's cake. It had chocolate frosting and big yellow roses. I led the singing of Happy Birthday. My mother carried the cake across the kitchen to the party table and set it down in front of Fudge. Sam cried, Too dark! Too dark! So Grandma had to turn on the kitchen lights before Fudge blew out his candles. When he was finished blowing, he reached out and grabbed a rose off his cake. He shoved it into his mouth. Oh, Fudge, my mother said, look what you did. But Grandma said, it's his birthday. He can do whatever he wants. So Fudge reached over and grabbed a second rose. I guess Fat Ralph couldn't stand seeing Fudge eat those yellow roses because he grabbed one too. By that time, the cake looked pretty messy. My mother, finally coming to her senses, took the cake away and sliced it up. Each kid got a Dixie cup, a small piece of cake, and some milk. But Jenny hollered, Where's my rose? Want one too? Because her slice of birthday cake didn't happen to have one. My mother explained that the roses were only decorations and that there weren't enough to go around. Jenny seemed to accept that. But when Grandma stood over her to help her open her Dixie, Jenny bit her on the hand. She bit me, Grandma cried. Did it break the skin, my mother asked. No, I don't think so, Grandma said, checking. Good, then it's nothing to worry about, my mother told her. Grandma went into the bathroom to put some medicine on it anyway. She wasn't taking any chances. Ralph was the first one to finish his food. More! More, more, he sang, holding up his empty plate. I don't think you should give him any more, I whispered to my mother. Look how fat he is now. Oh, Peter, this is a party. Let him eat whatever he wants. Okay, I said. Why should I care how fat he gets? My mother served Ralph a second piece of cake. He threw up right after he finished it. Me and Grandma took the kids into the living room while my mother cleaned up the mess. Grandma told Fudge he could open his presents while his friends watched. Jenny brought him a musical jack-in-the-box. When you turn the handle around, it plays Pop Goes the Weasel. When you reach the part of the song about Pop, the top opens and a funny clown jumps up. Fudge loved it. He clapped his hands and laughed and laughed, but Sam started to scream. No, no more. Take it away. He hid his face in his hands and wouldn't look up until Grandma promised to put the jack-in-the-box in another room. Fudge opened Ralph's present next. It was a little wind-up car that ran all over the floor. I kind of liked it myself. So did Ralph, because he grabbed it away from Fudge and said, Mine! No, Fudge shouted, Mine! When my mother heard the racket, she ran in from the kitchen. She explained to Ralph that he had brought the car to Fudge because it was his birthday. But Ralph wouldn't listen. I guess my mother was afraid he might throw up again, and this time on the living room rug. So she begged Fudge to let Ralph play with the car for a few minutes. But Ralph kept screaming that it was his car, so Fudge started to cry. Finally, my mother took the car away and said, Let's see what Sam brought you. Fudge liked that idea. He forgot about the little car as he ripped the paper and ribbon off Sam's package. 
It turned out to be a big picture dictionary, the same kind the Yarbies brought me a couple of months ago. Fudge got mad when he saw it. No, he yelled, no more books. He threw it across the room. Fudge, that's terrible, my mother said. You mustn't do that to the nice book. No book, Fudge said. Sam cried. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like my present. I want to go home. I want to go home. Grandma tried to comfort Sam while my mother picked up the book. She gathered the wrapping paper and ribbons and cards together. Fudge didn't even look at any of the birthday cards. Oh, well, he can't read, so I guess it doesn't make a difference. Peter, my mother said, let's start the games. Now, quick. I checked the time. I hoped the party was almost over. But no, it was only one thirty. Still an hour to go. I went into my room where I had blown up a lot of balloons. My mother had a party book, and it said three-year-olds like to dance around with balloons. When I got back to the living room, Mom started the record player, and I handed each kid a balloon. But they just stood there looking at me. I thought, either the guy who wrote that party book is crazy, or I am. Show them how, Peter, my mother said. Take a balloon and demonstrate. I felt like one of the world's greatest living fools dancing around with a balloon, but it worked. As soon as the kids saw me doing it, they started dancing too. Jenny's balloon popped. That nearly scared Sam right out of his mind. He started yelling and crying. Fortunately, I had blown up two dozen balloons. I was hoping they'd dance around the rest of the afternoon. Fudge got the idea of jumping up and down on the furniture. The others liked that too. So instead of dancing with their balloons, that's what they did. And soon they were running from room to room, yelling and laughing and having a great time. Then the doorbell rang. It was Mrs. Rudder. She lives in the apartment right under us. She wanted to know what was going on. She said it sounded like her ceiling was about to crash in on her any second. My mother explained that Fudge was having a little birthday party, and wouldn't she like to stay for a piece of cake? Sometimes my mother is really clever, so Grandma entertained Mrs. Rudder in the kitchen while Fudge and his buddies jumped up and down on his new bed. It was delivered this morning. Fudge hasn't even slept in it yet, so naturally when my mother found out what they were up to, she was mad. Stop right now, she said. New bed! Big boy, Fudge told her. Was he proud? You won't have a new big boy bed for long if you don't stop jumping on it, my mother told him. I know. Let's all sit down on the floor and hear a nice story. My mother selected a picture book from Fudge's bookshelf. I heard that one, said Jenny when she saw the cover. All right, my mother told her. Let's hear this one. She held up another book. I heard that one too, Jenny said. I think my mother was starting to lose her patience, but she chose a third book and said, We'll all enjoy this one, even if we know it by heart. And if we do know it by heart, well, we can say it together. That's just what Jenny did, and when my mother skipped a page by mistake, Jenny was right there to remind her. If you ask me, my mother felt like biting Jenny by that time. When the story was over, it was two o'clock, and Ralph was sound asleep on the floor. My mother told me to put him up on Fudge's new bed while she took the rest of the children back to the living room. I tried and tried, but I couldn't lift Ralph. He must weigh a ton. So I left him sleeping on Fudge's floor and closed the door so he couldn't hear any noise. On my way back to the living room, I wished the others would fall asleep, too. Peter, my mother suggested, why don't you show them Dribble? Mom, Dribble's my pet. You don't go around using a pet to entertain a bunch of little kids. Didn't my mother know that? Please, Peter, my mother said, we've still got half an hour left, and I don't know what to do with them anymore. Dribble, Fudge hollered. Dribble, dribble, dribble. 
I guess Sam and Jenny liked the way that sounded because they started to shout, Dribble! 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 Even though they didn't know what they were talking about. Oh, all right, I said. I'll show you dribble. But you've got to promise to be very quiet. You mustn't make a sound. You might scare him, okay? They all said, okay. My mother went into the kitchen to chat with Grandma and Mrs. Rudder. I went into my room and came back carrying Dribble in his bowl. I put my finger over my lip to remind Fudge and his friends to be quiet. It worked. At first nobody said a word. I put Dribble down on the table. Fudge and Sam and Jenny stood over his bowl. Oh, turtle, Jenny said. Yes, Dribble's a turtle. My turtle, I said in a soft voice. See, see, Fudge whispered. They can all see, I told Fudge. Nice turtle, Sam said. I wondered why he wasn't afraid this time. What does Dribble do, Jenny asked. Do? He doesn't do anything special, I said. He's a turtle. He does turtle things. Like what, Jenny asked. What was with this kid anyway? Well, I said, he swims around a little and he sleeps on his rock and he eats. Does he make? Jenny asked. Make, I said. Make a tinkle. Oh, that. Well, sure, I guess so. Jenny laughed. So did Sam and Fudge. I make tinkles too. Wanna see? Jenny asked. No, I said. See, see, Fudge laughed, pointing at Jenny. Jenny had a big smile on her face. Next thing I knew, there was a puddle on the rug. Mom, I hollered, come quick. My mother dashed in from the kitchen. What, Peter, what is it? Just look at what Jenny did, I said. What is that, my mother asked, eyeing the puddle. She made on the floor, I said, and on purpose. Oh, Jenny, my mother cried, you didn't. Did too, Jenny said. That was very naughty, my mother told her. You come with me. She scooped up Jenny and carried her into the bathroom. After that, Mother mopped up the puddle. Finally, the doorbell rang. It was 2.30. The party was over. I could hardly believe it. I was beginning to think it would never end. First, Ralph's mother came. She had to wake him up to get him out of the apartment. I guess even she couldn't carry him. Next, Jenny's mother came. Mom gave her Jenny's wet pants in a baggie. That was all she had to do. Jenny's mother was plenty embarrassed. Sam's mother came last, and he didn't want to go home. Now that he was used to us, I guess he liked us. He cried, more party, more. Another time, his mother said, dragging him out of our apartment by the arm. My mother flopped down in a chair. Grandma brought her two aspirins and a glass of water. Here, dear, she said, maybe these will help. My mother swallowed the pills. She held her head. Three is kind of young for a party, I told my mother. Peter Warren Hatcher, my mother began. Yes, I asked. You are absolutely right. I flopped down next to my mother. She put her arms around me. Then we both watched Fudge work his new jack-in-the-box. Later, when my father came home, he said, How did Fudge's party go? My mother and I looked at each other, and we laughed. Chapter 6. Fang Hits Town Fudge liked his new bed a lot. There was just one problem. He fell out of it every night. By the fourth night, my mother and father got smart. They pushed the bed against the wall and surrounded the other side with chairs. Now there was no place for Fudge to fall. But every morning, my mother found him curled up in one of the chairs. My father said they could have saved their money since Fudge was so happy sleeping on an old chair. On Saturday, we had to go to the dentist. He wanted to check Fudge's mouth again to make sure everything healed all right since his flying experience. Dr. Brown is an old friend of my father's. They went to school together. He's always saying he takes special good care of me and Fudge because we're chips off the old block the old block being my father. His office is on the other side of the park. It's near Madison Avenue. 
My mother said we'd make a day of it, and wouldn't that be fun? I'd rather go to the movies with Jimmy Fargo, I told her. But we'll have such a good time, my mother said. The three of us will go out for lunch, and then we'll get new shoes for you and Fudge. I've been out to lunch with Fudge, I reminded her. He's growing up, Peter. He knows how to behave now. I'd still rather go to the movies with Jimmy. Well, you're coming with me, and that's that. I wasn't looking forward to my day, and Saturday morning is always the best day of the week. Every Saturday morning, I clean out Dribble's bowl. Sometimes, if Fudge is very good, I let him watch. Oh, I do it in the bathroom. First, I take Dribble out of his bowl and let him crawl around in the tub. I'm afraid to put him down on the floor. Somebody might step on him, but the tub I know is safe. Next, I take the rocks out of the bowl and wash them. The last thing I do is wash the bowl itself. I really scrub it. I even rinse it two or three times to make sure all the soap is out. When I'm done with that, I put the rocks back in and fill it with just the right amount of water. After I put Dribble back in his bowl, I feed him. Usually he goes right to sleep on his favorite rock. I guess running around in the bathtub really makes my turtle tired. Today I finished with Dribble just in time. My mother was rushing, mumbling about getting us to Dr. Brown's office in time for our appointment. When we were outside, we took the Crosstown bus, then walked a few blocks to his office. As soon as the nurse saw Fudge, she said, How's my favorite patient? She gave him a hug and a little book to read. To me, she said, Good morning, Peter. It burns me up the way people treat Fudge. He's not so special. He's just little, that's all. But some day he's going to be nine years old, too. I can't wait until he is. Then he'll know there's nothing so great about him after all. Soon the nurse said, Fudge, Dr. Brown is ready for you. Come with me now. Fudge took the nurse's hand. Dr. Brown has this rule about mothers in the examining room, with kids. They're not allowed. Mothers are a big problem. Dr. Brown told me once. I agree. I looked through a National Geographic magazine while I waited. After a few minutes, the nurse came out and whispered something to my mother. I looked up, wondering what the big secret was. Then my mother said, Peter, Dr. Brown would like you to help him with fudge. Help him, I said. I'm no dentist. The nurse said, Peter, dear, if you'll just come with me, I'm sure everything will work out fine. So I went with the nurse. What do I have to do? I asked her. Oh, not much. Dr. Brown just wants you to show Fudge how you open your mouth and how he checks your teeth. What do I have to do that for? I asked. I don't need a checkup yet. I just had one last month. Your brother won't open his mouth this morning, the nurse whispered. He won't, I whispered back. No, he won't, she said again. I thought that was pretty funny. I never considered refusing to open my mouth at the dentist's office. When he says, open, I open. When we reached the examining room, Fudge was sitting in the big chair. He had a towel around his neck, and he looked all ready for action. Dr. Brown was showing him lots of little things and explaining what he does with each one. Fudge kept nodding, but he wouldn't open his mouth. Ah, Peter, Dr. Brown said when he saw me. Would you open your mouth so I can count your teeth? That's what he tells little kids he's doing, counting their teeth. Little kids will believe anything. I went along with Dr. Brown's joke. I opened my mouth very wide much wider than when I'm the real patient. He put his mirror in and said, Wonderful teeth, just beautiful, a regular chip off the old block. Such a shame your brother can't open his mouth the way you do. Can do, Fudge said. No, Dr. Brown told him. You can't open your mouth nearly as good as Peter. Can so, see? Fudge opened his mouth. No, I'm sorry, Fudge, Dr. Brown said. It's still not as good as Peter. So Fudge opened his mouth really wide. Count teeth, he said. Count Fudgy's teeth. 
Well, Dr. Brown pretended to think about it. Count, Fudge shouted. Well, Dr. Brown said again, scratching his head, I guess as long as you're here, I might as well count your teeth. So he checked Fudge's mouth. When he was through, Fudge said, See, see, just like PETA. Yes, Dr. Brown said, smiling, I can see that. You're just like Peter. He gave me a wink. I liked the way Dr. Brown tricked Fudge into opening his mouth. So when he was through examining him, I whispered, Couldn't you make Fudge some false teeth until his grown-up ones come in? No, he'll just have to wait, Dr. Brown said. But he looks like he has fangs, I told him. You'd better not say that in front of your mother, Dr. Brown said. I know it. She's not too big on fangs. Dr. Brown thanked me for helping him. My mother made another appointment for Fudge. The nurse kissed my brother goodbye, and we left. That wasn't so bad, was it, Peter? My mother said. It could have been worse, I admitted. We headed for Bloomingdale's, where we get our shoes. There are five salesmen in the children's shoe department. One of them my mother doesn't like. She thinks they don't measure my feet carefully. That all they care about is selling shoes, even if they don't have the right sizes in stock. The other ones my mother thinks are okay. There's one she likes a lot. His name is Mr. Berman. I like him too because he's funny. He usually makes believe that the right shoe goes on the left foot or that Fudge's shoes are really for me. Anyway, when Mr. Berman waits on us, buying shoes is almost fun. Today, Mr. Berman spotted us right away. He always remembers our name. Well, if it isn't the Hatcher boys, he said. In the flesh, I told him. Fudge opened his mouth for Mr. Berman. See, see, all gone. His teeth, my mother explained to Mr. Berman. He knocked out his top two front teeth. Well, congratulations, Mr. Berman said. That calls for a celebration. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out two lollipops. He handed one to me and the other one to Fudge. Oh, Fudge said, lolly. Mine was root beer flavored. I hate root beer, but I thanked Mr. Berman anyway. I'll save it for after lunch, I told him. Handing it to my mother, she put it into her purse. Fudge got a lemon lolly. He ripped off the paper and started sucking right away. Now then, what'll it be, boys? Mr. Berman asked. My mother answered, brown and white sandals for Fudge and loafers for Peter. Okay, Peter, let's see how those feet have grown. I slipped out of my old shoes and stood up. I stuck my left foot into Mr. Berman's foot measure. Then he turned it around and I put my right foot in. That's another reason why my mother thinks Mr. Berman is good at selling shoes. He measures both feet. Some other salesmen only measure one. My mother says feet can be different sizes, even on the same person, and it's important to make sure the size fits the biggest foot. What color loafers, Peter? Mr. Berman asked. Brown, I said, same as my old ones. When Mr. Berman went into the back to look for shoes for me, my mother noticed a hole in the toe of my sock. Oh, Peter, why didn't you tell me you had a hole in your sock? I didn't know I had one, I said. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. It's my sock, Mom. Why should you be embarrassed, I asked. Well, it looks terrible. I mean to come shopping for shoes with a hole in your sock. That's just awful. Can't you hide it a little? Where should I hide it? Try to get the hole in between your toes so it doesn't show, my mother said. I wiggled my sock around trying to rearrange my hole. My mother sure worries about silly things. Mr. Berman came out with two pairs of loafers. He likes to try different sizes to make sure I'm getting the right one. One pair was much too big. The other pair fit fine. Wear or wrap? Mr. Berman asked my mother. Wrap, please, she said. We'll wear the old ones home. I have never been allowed to wear the new shoes home from the store. Don't ask me why, but my mother always has the new pair wrapped up, and I can't wear them until the next day. When I was finished, Mr. Berman untied Fudge's shoes and measured his feet. Brown and white saddle shoes, my mother reminded him. Mr. Berman went into the back and returned with two shoe boxes. 
but when he opened the first box and fudge saw the saddle shoes he said no no what my mother asked him no shoes fudge said he started kicking his feet don't be silly fudgy you need new shoes my mother told him no 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 he hollered everybody in the shoe department looked over at us here's the perfect size mr berman told fudge holding up one shoe wait till you see how nice these new shoes will feel fudge kicked some more it was impossible for mr berman to get the shoes on his feet he screamed no shoes no 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 my mother grabbed hold of him but he was wiggling all around he managed to give mr berman a kick in the face lucky for him fudge only had on socks now look fudge my mother said you must get new shoes the old ones are too small so what kind do you want i don't know why my mother bothered to talk to him like he was a regular person because when fudge gets himself into a temper tantrum he doesn't listen to anything by that time he had thrown himself onto the floor where he beat his fists against the rug what kind do you want fudge because we're not leaving here until you have new shoes my mother said like she meant it i figured we'd be there for the rest of the day or maybe the week how could my mother have been embarrassed over a little hole in my sock and then act like nothing much was happening when her other son was on the floor yelling and screaming and carrying on i'm going to count to three my mother told fudge and then I want you to tell me which shoes you want. Ready? One, two, three. Fudge sat up. Like Peter's, he said. I smiled. I guess the kid really looks up to me. He even wants to wear the same kind of shoes. But everybody knows you can't buy loafers for such a little guy. They don't come in your size, Mr. Berman told Fudge. Yes, yes, yes like peter's fudge hollered mr berman held up his hands and looked at my mother as if to say i give up but my mother said i have an idea she motioned for me and mr berman to come closer i had the feeling i wasn't going to like her idea but i listened anyway i think we'll have to play a little joke on fudge she said what do you mean i asked well suppose mr berman brings out a pair of saddle shoes in your size and oh no i said you're not going to get me to wear saddle shoes never let me finish my mother said mr berman can bring them out and you can try them on and then fudge will think that's what you're getting but when we leave we'll take the loafers that's mean i said you're taking advantage of him since when do you worry about that my mother asked since now i told her look peter my mother said checking her watch it's twelve o'clock i'm starved me too i said well then if you ever want to get some lunch let's try my idea okay okay i said i sat back in my chair while mr berman hurried to the stockroom again fudge looked up at me from his position on the floor like peter's he said yeah sure fudge i told him mr berman came back with a pair of brown and white saddle shoes in my size i tried them on did they look ugly see peter's nice saddle shoes my mother said now fudgy tries on his nice saddle shoes fudge let mr berman get him into his new pair of shoes see he said see like peter's he held up a foot that's right fudgy i said just like mine you sure can fool little kids easy where or rap mr berman asked my mother while fudge walked around in his new shoes rap of course she said i wondered what my mother would tell fudge tomorrow when i wore my new loafers oh well that really wasn't my worry it was her idea when fudge was back in his old shoes and our package was ready mr berman gave my brother a striped balloon he offered one to me too i refused how could he think a person in fourth grade might want a shoe store balloon that wasn't so terrible was it peter my mother said as we left the store it wasn't i asked well it could have been worse my mother said i suppose i answered we went to hamburger heaven for lunch we sat in a booth 
Fudge tossed his balloons around while my mother ordered for him, and then for herself. I ordered my own lunch, a hamburger with everything on it, and a chocolate milkshake. Fudge was getting a kitty special, meaning a hamburger without the roll, some mashed potatoes and a side order of green peas. When our lunch was served, my mother cut Fudge's hamburger into tiny little pieces, which he shoved into his mouth with his fingers. Then she handed him a spoon and told him to eat his mashed potatoes. But instead of eating them, he smeared them on the wall. See, he said. I thought you told me he wouldn't behave like that any more, I said to my mother. Fudgy, that's naughty. You stop it right now, my mother said. But Fudge sang, eat it or wear it. And he dumped the whole dish of peas over his head. I laughed. I couldn't help it. He looked so silly with the peas falling from his hair. And when I eat and laugh at the same time, I choke. So I choked on my pickle, and my mother had to whack me on the back, which gave Fudge another chance to spread mashed potatoes on the wall. That's when the waitress asked my mother, did we want anything else? No, thank you, my mother said. We have more than enough now. She wiped off the wall with her napkin and told Fudge he was very, very naughty. Not me, Fudge said, not me. Yes, you, my mother told him. Why can't you eat like Peter? See how nice Peter eats? Fudge didn't say anything. He just stuck his fork into his balloon. It popped and he screamed, All gone, want more balloon, more. Shut up, I told him. Can't you ever act human? That's enough, Peter, my mother said. She should have slugged him. That would teach that brother of mine how to behave in hamburger heaven. We took a cab home. Fudge fell asleep on the way. He had his fingers in his mouth and made his slurping noise. My mother whispered to me, Our day wasn't that bad, was it, Peter? I didn't answer. I just looked out the taxi window and decided that I would never spend a day with Farley Drexel Hatcher again. Chapter 7 The Flying Train Committee In January, our class started a project on the city. Mrs. Haver, our teacher, divided us up into committees by where we live. That way we could work at home. My committee was me, Jimmy Fargo, and Shyla. Our topic was transportation. We decided to make my apartment the meeting place because I'm the only one of the three of us who's got his own bedroom. In a few weeks, each committee had to hand in a booklet or a poster and be ready to give an oral report. The first day we got together after school, we bought a yellow poster board. Jimmy wanted a blue one, but Shyla talked him out of it. Yellow is a much brighter color, she explained. Everything will show up on it. Blue is too dull. Shyla thinks she's smarter than me and Jimmy, put together just because she's a girl. So right away she told us she would be in charge of our booklet and me and Jimmy could do most of the poster, as long as we check with her first to make sure she likes our ideas. We agreed, since Shyla promised to do ten pages of written work and we would only do five. After we bought the yellow poster board, we went to the library. We took out seven books on transportation. We wanted to learn all we could about speed, traffic congestion, and pollution. We arranged to meet on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons for the next two weeks. Our first few committee meetings turned out like this. We got to my place by 3.30, had a snack, then played with dribble for half an hour. Shyla gave up on cooties when Fudge lost his front teeth. But it still isn't much fun to have her hanging around. She's always complaining that she got stuck with the worst possible committee oh, and that me and Jimmy fool more than we work. We only put up with her because we have no choice. Shyla and Jimmy have to be home for supper before 5.30, so at 5 o'clock we start cleaning up. We keep our equipment under my bed in a shoebox. We have a set of magic markers, Elmer's glue, scotch tape, and a really sharp pair of scissors, and a container of silver sparkle. Shyla carries our committee booklet back and forth with her. She doesn't trust us enough to leave it at my house. 
The poster board fits under my bed, along with our supplies. We stack the library books on my desk. The reason I make sure we clean up good is that my mother told me if I left a mess, we'd have to find some place else to work. By our third meeting, I told Jimmy and Shyla that I'd figured out the solution to New York City's traffic problems. We have to get rid of the traffic, I said. There shouldn't be any cars or buses or taxis allowed in the city. What we really need is a city-wide monorail system. That's too expensive, Shyla said. It sounds good, but it's not practical. I disagree, I told Shyla. It's very practical. Besides, getting rid of traffic, it'll get rid of air pollution, and it'll get people where they're going a lot faster. But it's not practical, Peter, Shyla said again. It costs too much. I opened one of my books on transportation and read Shyla, quote, A monorail system is the hope of the future. I cleared my throat and looked up. But we can't write a report just about the monorail, Shyla said. We'll never be able to fill 20 written pages on that. We can write big, Jimmy suggested. No, Shyla said. I want a good mark on this project. Peter, you can write your five pages about the monorail system and how it works. Jimmy, you can write your five pages about pollution caused by transportation. And I'll write my ten pages on the history of transportation in the city. Shyla folded her arms and smiled. Can I write big? Jimmy asked. I don't care how big you write as long as you put your name on your five pages, Shyla told him. That's not fair, Jimmy said. This is supposed to be a group project. Why should I have to put my name on my five pages? Then don't write big, Shyla shouted. Okay, okay, I'll write so small Mrs. Haver will need a microscope to see the letters. Very funny, Shyla said. Look, I told both of them. I think all our written work should be in the same handwriting. That's the only fair way. Otherwise, Mrs. Haver will know who did what, and it won't be a group project. Say, that's a good idea, Jimmy said. Which one of us has the best handwriting? Me and Jimmy looked at Shyla. Well, I do have a nice even script, Shyla said. But if I'm going to copy over your written work, you better give it to me by Tuesday. Otherwise, I won't have enough time to do the job. And you two better get going on your poster. Shyla talked like she was the teacher and we were the kids. Me and Jimmy designed the whole poster ourselves. We used the pros and cons of each kind of transportation. It was really clever. We divided a chart into land, sea, and air, and we planned an illustration for each, with the airplane done in silver sparkle and the letters done in red and blue magic marker. We got halfway through the lettering that day. We also sketched the ship, the plane, and the truck. When Shyla saw it, she asked, Is that supposed to be a train? No, I told her, it's a truck. It doesn't look like one, she said. It will, Jimmy told her, when it's finished. I hope so, Shyla said, because right now it looks like a flying train. That's because the ground's not under it yet, Jimmy said. Yeah, I agreed. See, we've got to make it look like it's on a street. Right now, it does kind of look like it's up in space. So does the ship, Shyla said. We'll put some water lines around it, I told her, and some clouds around the plane, Shyla said. Listen, Jimmy hollered, did anybody ever tell you you're too bossy? This poster is ours. You do the booklet. Remember, that's the way you wanted it. See, there you go again, Shyla said. You keep forgetting this is a committee. We're supposed to work together. Working together doesn't mean you give the orders and we carry them out, Jimmy said. My feelings exactly, I thought. Shyla didn't answer Jimmy. She picked up her things, got her coat, and left. I hope she never comes back, Jimmy said. She'll be back, I told him. We're her committee. Jimmy laughed. Yeah, we're all one happy committee. I put our poster under the bed, said goodbye to Jimmy, then washed up for supper. My mother was being pretty nice about our committee meetings. She arranged to have Fudge play at Ralph's apartment on Tuesdays and at Jenny's on Thursdays. Sam has the chicken pox, so he can't play at all. 
I was glad that next week would be our last committee meeting after school. I was sick of Shyla, and I was getting sick of transportation. Besides, now that I knew a monorail system was the only way to save our city, I was getting upset that the mayor and all the other guys that run things at City Hall weren't doing anything about installing one. If I know that's the best method of city transportation, how come they don't know it? The next day, when I came home from school, I went to my bedroom to see Dribble, like I always do. Fudge was in there, sitting on my bed. Why are you in my room? I asked him. He smiled. You know you're not supposed to be in here. This is my room. Want to see? Fudge said. See what? Want to see? What? What are you talking about? I asked. He jumped off my bed and crawled underneath it. He came out with our poster. He held it up. See, he said, pretty. What did you do, I yelled. What did you do to our poster? It was covered all over with scribbles in every color magic marker. It was ruined. It was a mess, and it was ruined. I was ready to kill Fudge. I grabbed my poster and ran into the kitchen to show it to my mother. I could hardly speak. Look, I said, feeling a lump in my throat. Just look at what he did to my poster. I felt tears come to my eyes, but I didn't care. How could you let him? I asked my mother. How? Don't you care about me? I threw the poster down and ran into my room. I slammed the door and took off my shoe and flung it at the wall. It made a black mark where it hit. Well, so what? I heard my mother hollering. And then Fudge crying. After a while, my mother knocked on my bedroom door and called. Peter, may I come in? I didn't answer. She opened the door and walked over to my bed. She sat down next to me. I'm very sorry, she said. I still didn't say anything. Peter, she began. I didn't look at her. She touched my arm. Peter, please listen. Don't you see, Mom? I can't ever do my homework without him messing it up. It just isn't fair. I wish he was never born. Never. I hate him. You don't hate him, my mother said. You just think you do. Don't tell me, I said. I mean it. I really can't stand that kid. You're angry, my mother told me. I know that. And I don't blame you. Fudge had no right to touch your poster. I spanked him. You did? I asked. Fudge never gets spanked. My parents don't believe in spanking. You really spanked him? I asked again. Yes, my mother said. Hard? I asked. On his backside, she told me. I thought it over. Peter, my mother put her arms around me. I'll buy you a new poster board tomorrow. It was really my fault. I should never have let him into your room. That's why I need a lock on my door, I said. I don't like locks on doors. We're a family. We don't have to lock each other out. If I had a lock, Fudge wouldn't have gotten my poster. It won't happen again, my mother promised. I wanted to believe her, but really I didn't. Unless she tied him up, I knew my brother would get into my room again. The next day, while I was at school... My mother bought a new yellow poster board. The hard part was explaining to Jimmy that we had to start all over again. He was a good sport about it. He said this time he'd make sure his truck didn't look like a flying train. And I said this time I'd make pencil marks first so my letters didn't go uphill. Our committee met that afternoon. Shyla didn't mention the last time. Neither did we. Me and Jimmy worked on the poster while Shyla copied our written work into the booklet. We'd be ready to give our oral report to the class on Monday, not like some committees who hadn't even started yet. By five o'clock we had finished our poster, and Shyla was almost done with the cover for our booklet. Jimmy walked over and stood behind her watching her work. After a minute he yelled, What do you think you're doing, Shyla? I got up from the floor and joined them at my desk. I took a look at the cover. It was pretty nice. It said, Transportation in the City. Under that, it said, By Shyla Tubman, Peter Hatcher, and James Fargo. 
and under that, in small letters, it said, Handwritten by Miss Shyla Tubman. Now I knew why Jimmy was mad. Oh, no, I said, holding my hand to my head. How could you? Shyla didn't say anything. It's not fair, I told her. We didn't put our names on the poster. But the cover's all done, Shyla said. Can't you see that? I'll never get the letters so straight again. It looks perfect. Oh, no, Jimmy shouted. We're not handing the booklet in like that. I'll rip it up before I let you. He grabbed the booklet and threatened to tear it in half. Shyla screamed, You wouldn't. I'll kill you. Give it back to me, Jimmy Fargo. She was ready to cry. I knew Jimmy wouldn't tear it up, but I didn't say so. Peter, make him give it back. Will you take off that line about your handwriting? I asked. I can't. It'll ruin the booklet. Then I think he should rip it up, I said. Shyla stamped her foot. Ooh, I hate you both. You don't really, I told her. You just think you do. I know I do, Shyla cried. That's because you're angry right now, I said. I couldn't help smiling. Shyla jumped up and tried to get the booklet, but Jimmy held it over his head, and he's much taller than Shyla. She had no chance at all. Finally, she sat down and whispered, I give up. You win. I'll take my name off. You promise? Jimmy asked. I promise, Shyla said. Jimmy set the booklet down on my desk in front of Shyla. Okay, he said. Start. I'm not going to make a whole new cover, Shyla said. What I'll do is turn this bottom line into a decoration. She picked up the magic marker and made little flowers out of the words. Soon, handwritten by Miss Shyla Tubman, turned into sixteen small flowers. There, Shyla said, it's done. It looks pretty good, I told her. It would have looked better without those flowers, Jimmy said, but at least it's fair now. That night I showed my mother and father our new poster. They thought it was great, especially our silver sparkle airplane. My mother put the poster on the top of the refrigerator so it would be safe until the next day when I would take it to school. Now I had nothing to worry about. Shyla had the booklet, the poster was safe, and our committee was finished before schedule. I went into my room to relax. Fudge was sitting on the floor near my bed. My shoe box of supplies was in front of him. His face was a mess of magic marker colors, and he was using my extra sharp scissors to snip away at his hair. And the hair he snipped was dropping into Dribble's bowl which he had in front of him on the floor. See, he said, see Fudge. Fudgy's a barber. That night I found out hair doesn't hurt my turtle. I picked off every strand from his shell. I cleaned out his bowl and washed off his rocks. He seemed happy. Two things happened the next day. One was my mother had to take Fudge to the real barber to do something about his hair. He had plenty left in the back but just about nothing in front and on top. The barber said there wasn't much he could do until his hair grew back. Between his fangs and his hair, he was getting funnier looking every day. The second was my father came home with a chain latch for my bedroom door. I could reach it when I stood on tiptoe, but that brother of mine couldn't reach it at all, no matter what. Our committee was the first to give its report. Mrs. Haver said we did a super job. She liked our poster a lot. She thought the Silver Sparkle airplane was the best. The only thing she asked us was how come we included a picture of a flying train.